This episode is brought to you by Sterling Soap Company. How often do you think about your soap? Well, if you answered, not much, maybe you should. You see, a lot of what passes for soap in stores is technically not soap, according to the FDA's definition. It's full of lab-created chemicals and detergents because, well, it's cheaper to make. Now, what if you could buy natural soap made from natural ingredients like tallow, palm oil, coconut oil, and scented with essential oils, and for just a little more than you'd pay for grocery store soap? Sterling soap is 100% natural, and with a wide variety of bath soaps, shave soaps, beard balm, lotions, and cologne, there's a product and a scent for just about everybody. Check them out for yourself at sterlingsoap.com. That's S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G soap.com. Are you a hockey fan? Then you'll love Eric Zweig's new book, Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2. It's a treasure trove of untold tales, bizarre incidents, and captivating trivia that will leave even the most devoted puckhead astounded. The intense rivalries, epic showdowns, and historic clashes that shaped the NHL's early years, it's all in there. Zweig uncovers the true stories that helped shape the sport, ensuring that you will never look at hockey the same way again. Check out Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2 on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold. Hey, and welcome to another edition of This Dish, a proud member of the Sports History Network. You can find more info and more podcasts at sportshistorynetwork.com. This is your host, Steve White, and it's time to take a quick spin around the old sports universe. On this day in 1996, it was Carl Lewis proving that age is just a number. Lewis came into the 96 Olympic Games in Atlanta not really knowing what was in store. At 35 years old, he'd slowed down a bit. He'd dominated the sprint events in the 84 and 88 Olympics, and of course, he had won the long jump gold in both of those games. In Barcelona in 1992, he only competed in the 4x100 relay and the long jump, winning gold in both of those. Now, four years later in Atlanta, Carl had barely made the Olympic team in the long jump, finishing third at the trials. And then in qualifying, Lewis came close again to being excluded. On his final jump to meet the minimum qualifier for the finals, it was more reminiscent of a 23-year-old Lewis posting his longest jump in more than two years and was the longest jump of the qualifiers heading into the finals. But Lewis, who always seemed to rise to the occasion like his Olympic hero Jesse Owens, had more left in the tank. On his third jump, Lewis jumped 27.89 feet to set a standard that none of his much younger competitors could touch. It wasn't close to the world or even Olympic records, but it was good enough for gold on this night. With his win, he tied shot putter Al Order's record for winning gold in the same event in four consecutive Olympics. It was also his ninth Olympic gold medal, which at the time tied him for the most ever Olympic golds, with fellow American Mark Spitz, Finland's Pavo Nurmi, and the Soviet Union's Larissa Latinina. Of course, now Michael Phelps owns the most gold medals with 23. On this day in 1973, tragedy struck Formula One racing again. There's always an inherent danger for race car drivers, and that's accepted as part of the risk, but the 70s proved to be particularly harsh for Formula One. Between 1970 and 1978, nine drivers were killed participating in F1 World Championship events. Roger Williamson was a British driver who was new to F1. This was his rookie season, but he'd shown a lot of promise racing karts as a teen and then minis. He'd won titles in the Formula 3 series, and many were pegging him as a possible F1 champion in the future. He'd never get that chance, but it wasn't due to his racing inexperience, but more due to poor safety procedures at the racetrack. On this day, the series was racing in the Netherlands at Zandvoort. Williamson started 18th on the grid in a 24-car field that included Jackie Stewart, Nicky Lauda, and Graham Hill. On the eighth lap, Williamson's left tire lost pressure, causing him to lose control and go off track. So many things would go wrong in the next few minutes that if just one of them had been different, 
there's a really good chance Williamson could have walked away from this accident. First, his car hit barriers that had been installed incorrectly. His car flipped into the air as a result, and it rolled, and his car burst into flames. Williamson was conscious in the car, but he was trapped in his overturned car. Secondly, the race was not stopped. Instead, yellow caution flags were waved in that section to slow cars down, but with the race still going on, the fire engine could not get on the track to get to the burning car. One driver did realize the seriousness of the situation and he tried to help. David Purley jumped out of his race car and ran to assist. He stuck his hand into the burning car and tried to flip it over, but he was just one man and he couldn't move it. The marshals in that particular section were not prepared to help. They were not wearing clothing that were flame retarded and they could not do anything. Purley talked about the nightmare scene he was witnessing. He could see Williamson moving in the car, but no additional help arrived for another eight minutes. By that time, it was too late. Purdy said that if they could have gotten the car flipped over, Williamson could have gotten out on his own. Once the fire trucks did get there, after those agonizing eight minutes, Purley had died from smoke inhalation. He was 25 years old. On this day in 1995, it was the first game for each of the NFL expansion franchises, the Carolina Panthers and the Jacksonville Jaguars. This was the Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio, and was part of the exhibition schedule. Former Buffalo Bill and future Panther head coach, at least for a year, Frank Reich, started at quarterback for the Panthers, and Mark Brunel started under center for the Jags. The Panthers' top draft pick, Kerry Collins, also got some action. The Panthers won 20-14, and it was a little bit of a preview of things to come. Carolina went 7-9 in their inaugural season, and then surprised everybody in year two when they went 12-4 and and made it to the conference championship game. The Jaguars struggled like most expansion teams tend to do in their first year, winning only four games. Speaking of the Hall of Fame, on this day in 2017, Claire Smith became the first female sports writer to be honored by the Baseball Hall of Fame. She received the J.G. Taylor Spink Award for her work as a baseball writer, mostly with the New York Times. She also worked for the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Hartford Current, and ESPN. Initially, when she started covering baseball, she wasn't even allowed into the locker room to interview players after the game but she persisted, waiting until they opened and then doing her job. During her speech on this day, Smith, an African-American woman, said, I humbly stand on stage for those who were stung by racism or sexism or any other insidious bias and persevered. You are unbreakable. You make me proud. And that transitions us into a baseball story that would not make many people proud, because on this day in 1991, Oakland A's outfielder Jose Canseco was pelted with cups and a blow-up doll by New York Yankees fans. During the 70s, the Yankees became known as the Bronx Zoo, but that was really due to what the players were doing in the locker room and off the field more than what fans were doing in the stands. Well, on this night, the Bronx Zoo came to life in the stands, and to understand what happened on this night, you gotta go back a few months to May 10th. Uh, hang on a second, let me hit my uh, tape rewind button. Mm, there it is. Okay, so in May of 91, the New York press had been spying on Jose as he went into, and then a few hours later, out of the apartment building where Madonna lived at the time, Jose always seemed to be an easy target for the media, and the press ran with the story of Canseco and Madonna being together. Even though Canseco said that nothing happened while they were together that night, well, fast forward to... Uh, wait a second, hang on, I've got a fast forward button. Oh, there. Okay, so fast forward a few days to May 13th, when Canseco had to be restrained from going into the stands after a fan who had made fun of his Latino heritage. So now... Yankees fans knew they could get under Jose's skin, and they came to the ballpark with props on this night. There were a lot of taunts thrown his way, along with a few cups, but one fan had brought a blow-up doll, wearing a blonde wig and a shirt that read, I love Jose, to vaguely resemble the material girl. The game had to be stopped a few times due to the disruptions. 
Canseco did get the final laugh, though. He had a double, and he scored, and the A's won 10-8. Time now for today's non-sports Did You Know? Have you ever heard of the mysterious stone spheres of Costa Rica? There are over 300 of them, ranging in size from a few inches to over six and a half feet in diameter. They're remnants of the Dequis tribe of people from several thousand years ago. They were discovered in 1938, but the reason for their being made still remains a mystery. That's all for now. Go ahead and pencil me in for the same time tomorrow, because I'll be back with more This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sports. HistoryNetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.